Hello and welcome to this really um, just a simple tutorial on Airbus A320 startup procedures. We're going to be looking at the uh, manufacturer's standard procedures, Airbus standard procedures pretty much and just how we uh, work with those to use our simulator. Today using X-Plane 11 and the Flight Factor A320 model uh, which is pretty close to the real aircraft. Not, not entirely perfect but good enough that we can get a good idea from it. Okay, so as we approach the aircraft, and I won't uh, go to the external view to do this, but the first thing that happens is CM2, as they approach, has a look at the wheel chocks to make sure they're in place. Landing gear doors, check the position of those, and hopefully they're closed. They might be open. Do remember which position they're in, because that will um, influence some things a little bit later on in the checks. And then we look at the APU area to make sure that that's clear and that we're able to continue and start the APU should we need it or when we need it we will need it. From that we um, then go into the preliminary cockpit preparation checklist. Now most of the first part of this is done by CM2 that's the first officer and we start off by looking at um, let's have a look there we go our engine masters and we're going to check that those are in the off position then we're going to have a look at the engine mode selector and make sure that's in the normal position. Whether radar and predicted wind shear switch off and depending on which weather radar is fitted to your particular aircraft model it may not be the same as this but our system here is off. Landing gear lever we want to make sure that's down so let's have a look at that. Yep it's down and then we're going to have a look at the wiper selectors. Both of those are off. Really important those are off because the next thing we're going to be doing is applying some power to this aircraft and of course it would be a fairly bad idea to power the aircraft um, with the wiper switches on because that would move the wipers on a potentially dry windscreen and that can cause damage. So we then move to a section which is entitled batteries slash it's still power and we're going to check the batteries and then put them into water. The check is that the voltage is 25.5 volts or higher. If it's below 25.5 volts it's not a big problem but it just means we've got to carry out a 20 minute charging cycle which the aircraft will do for us and then after 20 minutes we can go and check the uh, batteries are indeed charged. So there we go 27.8, 28 volts those are good so let's put battery one into auto battery 2 into auto. Lots of lights coming on. Um, the ISS will be aligning but otherwise uh, not a lot is happening. So the next thing says external power push button on. Well external power is okay for us today so we'll push that and you can see that the aircraft is starting to come to life. Which is lovely news. The next thing is the APU fire test APU start and it says to us um, CM2 is going to set their RMP power so what we want to do is make sure that the RMP panel is working and uh, we obviously select a suitable frequency so that if we had a problem we could call air traffic we might have um, fire chief even or probably not fire chief on the other side but certainly air traffic so we can talk to somebody. Uh, so I'll just briefly set that ACP up now with VHF12 and the interphone as well if I need to talk to somebody outside. And then it asks me to do the APU fire test. Now the APU fire test, dead simple. I'm going to hold the button down. And um, it's going bing, 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 bing. We're happy. One thing we do in the aircraft, which is a little bit tricky in here, is when the uh, master warning light comes on we push that down and silence it one thing that you may come across is if you're doing this a little bit more quickly than we are today there's a period of time where the aircraft starts up and the um, the flight warning computers haven't woken up yet they're still doing their self-test so when you do the APU fire test all you'll get is the light on the overhead and the screw indicator coming on. That's a perfectly good test of the APU. And then the next thing it says APU as required. So we could start the APU now. We're not going to do that. Uh, but that's why we're doing the APU fire test now. And then external power button as required. Again, we keep the external power. ADIRS is the next thing. 
Uh, so the ADIRS system up here, three of them, and they're numbered one, two, three, um, in a particular order. So we'll put number one into nav. Now not many people do this, but we're meant to wait to see the on bat light come on. And then we're meant to wait for it to extinguish as well. And then we can do number two. Notice number two is on the first officer's side because that's where the first officer's information comes from. There's your on back light. And it extinguishes. And finally number three. And that's the standby system. So system one is captain, system two is first officer, system three is the standby. On back light. And extinguish. The reality is in, in the real world, you tend to turn one, two, three on and you just looked for one of the on bats. It's not really a good test of the system, but it's a pragmatic uh, approach that people will tend to take. But if you're on a line check, I'd recommend doing it properly like that, guys. Um, cockpit lights, we're going to set those up as required. So let's have a little look. That's already bright there. These lights are turned up as we want them. I tend not to have a flood light on to be honest. It's not ideal. The A320s kind of a little bit strange in so much as there are lights all over the place. It's like somebody shot lighting switches everywhere and you have to go on a hunt to find them. Uh, but if you want to set your lighting up as you like, remember you've got your individual lights underneath on each side and then just hidden in the middle here we've got the FCU lighting. So that um, can turn up and down the illumination and also the uh, digits themselves. Once you've done that, inside security check. So you're going to check certain security items, which I probably won't go into here. And then this is where things get more interesting, perhaps. EFB initialization, or EFB start. So we're going to chart, start probably our iPads, or tough pads, whatever we have on the aircraft. Make sure that we're on the same version. So um, if you're using FlySmart, which is the Airbus app, then that's really important. If you do that, it's important whichever app you're using. And then we're going to go through and initialise the uh, FMGC. So let's have a look at the FMGC. Here we go. Um, obviously the real one doesn't say license status, but the rest of it is fairly similar. And let's disregard the fact that the uh, day space is significantly out of days here. Uh, yep. So if we go and have a look at the aircraft status, if that page isn't already up, that's what we can check. The correct en engines are fitted. Uh, database is presumably valid. And then um, CM1, when you read the expanded check, there's a little bit of um, a discrepancy. The FCOM says CM1, and then uh, FlySmart actually suggests iPilot can do this. It's going to put the flight number in front to him. So let's have a look at that. We'll go to the init page. And today we're going to be flying from London Gatwick to, uh, let's say, Burnham, short flight. We pop that in, it says no route, that's fine. Put with that. And then we can do our flight number. Um, so let's say we're going to be A, B, C, or 1, 2, 3, something creative like that. Yeah? So it's done. And um, then we're going to check our EFB status, etc, etc. Then we get to aircraft acceptance. So at this stage, the CM1 is checking the aircraft library and they press and hold the recall push button for three seconds. Now, this is a little bit of a shortcoming of the simulation. Uh, so let me just see if I can show you. When we hold that one, two, three, it should, where it says IR in the line six minutes, come up with normal. Um, What's happening there is when we hold it for three seconds or longer, anything that we suppressed using the emergency cancel button is unsuppressed and then it will bring back any old messages that were hidden by, uh, let's say, a previous crew. So it's an important step. Logbook and MEL CDL items are checked. The aircraft configuration summary, you look in the iPad and see what's different about this airplane. Maybe it's a Neo, maybe it's a CO, is it a 320, is it a 321, has it got row rocks? Has it got soft go around function, etc., etc.? And then we look at the OEBs. So I'm just looking at a standard A320 for a UK airline. It has no OEBs by three company OEBs that uh, we accept every day. And then with that done, CM1 accepts the aircraft. 
The next thing we do is we get the airfield data. So that's basically we listen to the ATIS, um, or we might be able to get digital ATIS, but we're looking to get some form of uh, data for the airfield. And then we can look at uh, using, if we've got the load sheet application, putting the preliminary data into there, and making sure we've got any MEL or CDL items put into the iPads. We're going to arrange our navigation charts, and then we're going to carry out our uh, performance takeoff data on the iPads do it independently obviously we agree how we're going to do that and then we come back together compare when that's done we said great fantastic and we get to the bit to the checklist says before walk around the pm at this phase is going to do a few checks um, the pf is just waiting for the pm to do that technically and once they've completed all of this is where they can then crack on with their flows in reality things tend to be a little bit more muddled than that but let's look say on the ECAM, we're going to have a look at the oxygen pressure. Where you can see here that my oxygen pressure says 1850. It's also got regulated low pressure. That is because, uh, you can see here, the crew supply is turned off. That's pretty normal. Continuing down, it says hydraulic quantity. So if we go and press the high push button, you can see, if I just zoom in a little bit, that we've got the sufficient quantity all of them are in the green and then we're going to have a look at the engine oils and again you can see that our engine oils meet the requirements set down in the FCOM that then takes us to flaps check position so what are we looking for well they're in the zero position they're also selected to zero so it agrees that's what we really want to check speed brake lever check retracted and disarmed let's have a look at that yep it's retracted and disarmed that's the arm position we want it retracted and disarmed accumulator brake pressure check so this is where we have a little moment and we go oh it's not in the green it has to be in the green that's the requirement so to do that, you would think easy peasy would turn on the green hydraulic pump. And do you remember before we came out to the aircraft, we had a look at the position of the gear doors? So, in fact, I just said the green hydraulic pump. I kind of made a mistake there. It's the yellow hydraulic pump we turn on because the uh, yellow system looks after this uh, accumulator pressure and the, um, the brakes. So, if I turn on the yellow pump, with the parking brake on in this situation what's going to happen is the PTU will activate and that will drive the green system now the problem with that is the landing gear doors are controlled by the green system so if you imagine the situation we power the yellow system the green system powers and there's an engineer working downstairs in the landing gear bay the doors will immediately close and it has happened before it's not a good outcome Today we've checked with the ground crew and they're happy for us to power the electric pump. So we're going to pop the yellow electric pump on, hide, yellow, elect pump, on. And if we go back and have a look down here, we should see that we now have a green indication on the accumulator. So we can turn the yellow electric pump off now. Um, technically I suppose we could turn the PTU off before we did that and that would inhibit the green but it probably the reason we don't do that is if that system failed and PTU came alive then you'd be endangering ground stuff so you've got to be quite careful with that okay uh, continuing on we're going to have a look at the parking brake handle yep that is set emergency equipment to check so I'm not going to go through what the emergency equipment is beyond things like life vests ropes etc etc CB panels check so, you've got to check the CBs up here, and you're also going to check all the CBs on the back wall here. Now, in the rear aircraft, there's um, a jump seat. You can just see it there, actually, uh, folded down. You've got to move that jump seat. I don't think I can do it in here, no. But you need to move the jump seat out of the way. There are CBs behind there, and there's usually a video camera up in the top corner uh, by the electrical systems. Again, you've got to vote than that just move out of the way and have a really good check of things we're going to check the gear pins where are the gear pins well 
they're back here in a little um, tray just down in this area again difficult to see in this simulator and an exterior walk around form so that gets us through to the end of the preliminary cockpit preparation checklist so from there on then the pilot flying um, becomes can start their flow so you probably noticed that um, in the before walk run we changed from being cm1 cm2 to pilot flying and pilot monitoring so it could be the captain or the first officer carrying out these checks that we've just done there let's have a look then the flow start on the uh, left hand side of the overhead panel the, left, the overhead panel is um, in three major sections and we tend to flow bottom to top the aim of the game is to extinguish the right lights mostly you can see the crew supply off and then we get to the CVR we're going to put the ground control on and press and hold the button it takes a little while and in the real aircraft it's quite often a thing called the Larsen effect the sort of um, microphone howl round, round that you get don't worry too much about that that's quite normal working our way up the next thing we're going to do is make sure that this evac switch is in the captain position or it might be captain person depends on the airline for us it's going to be captain and you can see that there's something going on with those we'll come to that in a moment working our way up and just checking everything's in good order here then we're into oops not quite the right switch that's good so the lights um, going to put the strobe light into auto the nav lights to system one unless there's a problem with system one whether i might take system two no smokings are going to be in auto and the seat belts well depends if we've had our fuel or not uh, let's put them on assume we've been fueled once the exit lights they can go to arm the enunciated test is going to be checked but not now it's not really actually a check of the lights bulb some airlines do check the light bulbs um, but what we're looking for is to do with the cockpit door um, so we'll look at that test in a little bit let's put some dome lighting on and then we can move up towards here uh, we want to make sure that this switch is in the auto position we can check that down here if we have got the correct system to spare. we don't need to do that then uh, but it is if you want to it's not a bad idea uh, for some reason we've got an engine two on MTR's fault we're not going to worry about that uh, although that might be a little bit of a cause for concern in reality working our way up into the air conditioning panel no white lights to extinguish just making sure everything's in the correct position uh, pack flow depends really on how many passengers let's say we've got a passenger load of something like about 100 passengers today so we'll put it into the low position again airline dependent on how they do that and that brings us up to the electrical panel you see we're on the external power and the batteries we put into auto we're now going to actually check those batteries so to do that uh, let's do it this way i'm going to bring up the electrical page and i'm just going to separate that out just for a moment uh, there we go so i'm going to turn the batteries off and you notice that they now say off on the sd back there you go and we're looking that there we go the charging and also that the charge the uh, current drops below 60 amps within uh, a certain period of time I think it's, um, I think it's 10 seconds but i'll have to check in the f one so anyway if you've got high amperage there you just want to have a look at that and then the bcl is going to the bcl being the battery charge limit is going to disconnect in a moment so that's a good check of the electrical system there. white lights on the fuel pumps they can all be extinguished and then we go up here uh, so we're going to do a check of the fire extinguishers when we do the fire test i'm going to press and hold the button and what we'll be looking for is uh, if i can just get to a normal position here a few things so we should be getting the agents and the fire light coming on we should see relevant messages um, for ecam come up here and we'd also be looking for um, the master warning lights come on which we can cancel and finally if i just move that out of the way we should see a red light behind the fire switch so try and do that so there's the lights 
there's the UCAM, there's the master warning we would cancel that and you can just see the fire light on behind the master one Let's switch. We did the APU earlier so just to engine two, pushed, lights came on, there's the UCAM and there's our fire light switch. So that's a good test of those. And this is the one most people forget. We're going to just continue a little bit further up and make sure the audio switching switch is in the normal position. Great stuff. Then we can go over to the right hand side. Uh, working our way up looking for white lights. We've got some of the cargo system not fitted to most aircraft, but this one has got the cargo system on it, so let's distinguish those. And this is kind of important here. Um, not everybody fits this. Most airlines do. Some manage to save money by not fitting that. Usually says A cars um, because it's used for data loading. But we want to make sure this PA button is depressed because what that does is allows the PA to be recorded onto the cockpit voice recorder. Uh, hopefully that will never be used. And then hidden away in the corner here, I don't know if I can get a good look. Yeah, we can start it. We have the maintenance panel there. And again, looking for any white lights or anything like that. So that's the overhead panel flow completed. That brings us now through to um, this central section. And we're going to work our way through here. Uh, not worrying too much about pressure settings or anything. We're just flowing, checking the IS, IS, the ISIS. That's right. Working our way through this. Ooh, that's a really steam driven one. Uh, don't, seems, don't see those very often. Just going to put that there in order. Along the bottom, you've got the time. 1325, 1325, but it's really important the clocks are correct on these because a lot of systems are driven by the clock. Uh, again, having a quick look at the humidity pressure and just making sure that the nose wheel steering switch is in the on position and speed of nose wheel steering. If it's off, then you, you're not more of it. That's going to take us through to uh, our flows here. And what we're going to do is set up the ACPs. So this is an RMP here, remember we set the RMP earlier so we can talk uh, to ground. Now I've got our ACP set. Normally you do your own individual sides. Working our way down, lighting's there, we've done all the, the radar already. Uh, speed brakes have been checked. We do a cockpit door check, now difficult to do um, in the simulator, but essentially we, we're going to close the door, press unlock and make sure it does unlock, then make sure it locks. and. The thing we're looking for, do you remember the enunciated light test? We put that into test. And up here on the overhead, uh, can I get there? I think. Yeah. You'll just see. Really hard. That's it. These three lights that say strike on them. And those need to come on. So that's a good functional test of the uh, flight at the door. Working our way up, switching panel on in the normal position, thrust levers to idle, engine masters off, normal on the mode, step to parking brake set, checking the pressure, still, good pressures, and the accumulator supply. And then we're checking the uh, gravity gear extension handle is in position there. And then flowing down through the right hand side, panels, lighting, and finally that's been left in a funny position. Let's put that to hybrid norm piece and then like 2000 and standby. And we tend to use uh, above at this stage altitude reporting and they're going to claim the captain's flying stage so it's our latency one. Set it to the side that you're using. So far so good. What we do now is we start to dive into this beastie, the um, the box, the McDoo, and the data would come from um, our flight plan, our fob. And the first thing we do, remember, is we can have a look at the data, confirm that, then we press init, Put the front two in, which is already done. Flight number. Uh, we'll claim our. Uh, let's have something like Manchester as an alternate. Flight number's in. Modern aircraft actually auto align the IRSs, but this one being a little bit old, we can just align on there. And now I finish off the alignment. 
um, it's been flashing away saying that it's aligning for quite a long time. Um, we'll see if those lights now are in the final minute of the alignment. Cost index, let's say 15. And it's going to be quite a low one. Um, quite a low one, five zero. I don't know the um, actual temperature, so we'll just leave it as it is. From the ATIS, we've taken a temperature of 14, so put that in. On the real, the real aircraft, that would come up as um, a large flight, just like the flight level there. It's just not quite working the simulation. And we'll claim our tropical quarter is something like that. Again, this is taken from the paperwork. On more modern ones, Init B has a, a place here where we can put our head or tail wind in, not on this uh, simulation, but you might want to do that now. So that's good so far. We can then look at the flight plan. Let's clear that message. And we're going to do a lateral revision on Gatwick and select tar departure from one way two six. Uh, we'll say it's a Compton departure maybe. And uh, we can insert that. And then let's put an arrival into Birmingham. Um, probably an ILS on um, yeah, ILS 3-3. Um, maybe a Grove one, Charlie. With no virus, we're not going to do that part of things. Temporary insert. You can see there's a little bit of a discontinuity here. I'm happy to remove that. So you just press clear and delete the discontinuity. So just a, a very, very simple flight plan setup for today. If we go and have a look at this view, we can actually pop the thing into uh, the plan mode. And as we zoom out, we can see our little um, route work its way. It's a messy route, isn't it? It's going all the way back to Compton and back to Buzzard. So it's probably not realistic, but again, I'm not too concerned about that right now. Radnab page. Anything that we want to hard tune, we can do there. You can see that it's already picked up the India Lima Juliet, uh, which is a big thing. That means that the aircraft is going to actually be able to go into uh, runway mode on the takeoff roll, and that will help it with, um, with the deviation bar that we get to guide us on the runway should we need it. Uh, I'm not going to tune anything particularly here, but I could do it if I wanted to put in something like. Uh, BH actually, for example, so maybe that's not uh, in the database, maybe it's the wrong one. Let's put Compton um, hard tube to see if it's it. So C, B, T. There we go, it comes up as a hard tuned radio. Let's get rid of that though, I don't want that. So that's about my page. And then we go to init B. So, um, let's have a look in here. We can actually, if you're using this add on, it's quite neat and you can get your zero fuel rates from here. So let's look at the performance data and zero fuel rates, a uh, little bit of zoom in 46.4 and 19.5. So 46.4, 19.5. And what have we got on our block? Um, we've got 9.6, this is really about weight more than anything. Do that. And let's claim our alternate says something like one ton on the flight plan. So we want to make sure that we have our correct alternate fuel in. And maybe if our reserve's different, just make sure all of these numbers are what you put on the paperwork. That's giving me a uh, takeoff weight and weight which we can work from for the performance which we've already done. And, uh, our actual takeoff CG 19.8. So I'm just gonna have a quick look at that. 19.8 uh, I'm just using the uh, Airbus performance's um, trim setting of 1.9 uh, which I'll need a little bit later. So that's performance done so far. Uh, so knows, that's an it being done. Performance. I'm going to put some random numbers in here. Uh, so 134, uh, 135. And let's put it in about 136 actually. So these are made up numbers, they're not real numbers. We'll put a flex temperature of you know, made up 52. 
it's going to be a flat bottom takeoff and we said it's going to be 1.9 up. You can put 1.9 up or 1.9, it doesn't matter. It will accept either or as you can see. And if you're going to be taking a takeoff shift, let's say you're using a, um, an intersection that is 125 meters there. So put all that good stuff in. Now today, you can see our clean speed is quite low, 197 knots. Uh, but it might be that we've got a really heavy aircraft, maybe a heavy 321, and we need to keep the speed back in the first turn. Um, so if you want to pre-select speed, you can do something like uh, 205, whatever you, you need, and you can pre-select it there. What the aircraft will do is as it climbs out and starts accelerating, it will go into selected speed from manage speed and use that speed there, uh, which can be quite useful tactically. I'm going to take that out and I'm happy to save manage speed today. So that's performance done so far. Progress page, we're going to put in EGKK, uh, two six left. So we've got some good information about where we are. Excellent. Next thing we'll do is look at the secondary flight plan. And it's a copy of the active. Now you can see that this secondary is going to take us to Birmingham. I don't want to do that. I'm going to put in an engine fail procedure of some kind. So, what we'll do is put a discontinuity in and say we're going to go to uh, Compton maybe for the engine fail procedure, just as a, a made up. The new destination is going to be Gatwick. So now we can see that it goes off initially, a bit of a discontinuity, Compton, Gatwick, uh, we'll fly an ILS, runway 26 left, let's bring it back, there we go, ILS 26 left, don't need any of that. And the last thing is we want to put a hold in, uh, let's say our hold is 270 with right turns, again this is company specific so whatever your um, electronic flight bag suggests then you pop that in. And there we go, the second has now got some good information in there. One more thing to do with your second flight bag is go to performance and have a look at the approach. Now Gatwick, uh, let's I think we might be able to do this. Uh, so quick look, if I go and get a Gatwick chart up on my uh, Lido here and have a look what Gatwick use for their um, ATIS. So that's EGKK. Yeah. What ages. So one three six five two five. So let's have a look, see if we can make it work. London Gatwick Information Hotel 1300 Zulu weather, wind 230 at 10, visibility 10, rain, sky conditions 1100 few, 3100 scattered, 5100 broken, temperature 11, dew point 10, altimeter 3014, arriving runway 26 left, departing runway 26 left, advise on initial contact you have hotel. OK, so we've got some weather there, um, and it's, it's using American units in normal. 1021, uh, temperature is 11, and the wind was 23010. London Gatwick Information Hotel 1300 Zulu weather, wind 230 at 10, right, visibility 10, rain, be. sky conditions 1100 few, 3100 scattered, 5100 broken. Temperature 1-1, one, one. dew point 1. Lovely. So we're doing that, and the final thing you'd want to put on there is have a look at the instrument approach chart. Um, the minima for cap 1 is 400 feet gap width. So type 400 on the barrow. And that says barrow on the new aircraft, not MGA. 
Okay, yeah, that's all set. So that gives us then our approach um, back into gap, which should we need to do. You could go further and put the NSA in as a reminder. Uh, for the go around, it's going to be 2100 feet. Go worst case, 2300 feet. So that's the FMS is fully set up. By this stage, hopefully, the pilot comes back. Uh, turn from outside, they'll tell you something like war plans complete, no findings, fuel panels closed, fuel caps in place. And we can then do our joint setups. So we tend to go now to um, opening up this wonderful little thing here. And we're going to do the oxygen test. It's done like this. We hold the button. We're looking for the um, amber lights to come on and off. Then you press and hold the red emergency button and the test button and make sure it stays on. Release it, make sure that it's still in 100% and then press the red button on its own to make sure that there's no oxygen flow. First officer does the same thing and then we just flow in through here making sure that our PFDs and everything is set up, checking the information we've got there. Now we're going to climb out to probably about 4,000 feet. We haven't got our clearance yet, so what we'll do is we'll put uh, 3,900. You see it goes to climb nav 1 FD2. Working our way across, we've got the flight directs on, we'll have constraints on my side, and we'll go constraints on the FO side. We've got the VORs showing. I think that is sensible. And all we want to have on the panel right now is 3,900 showing. Once you've set an odd number, you probably put it back to thousands unless you are likely to get really strange things like 4,200 feet after departure or whatever it might be. And we get our clearance. Clearance comes in and they uh, clear is for which, which departure are we going to do? Uh, there we go. Compton 3 Bravo, I imagine it's quite an old one. And just assume the Compton 3 Bravo goes to 4,000 feet initially. Uh, it may be something different. Again, this is just for the example. And they give you a score for 2122. Two, two. Two, one, two, two. And the pilot flying says, OK, so it's runway 26 left, Compton 3 Bravo, 4,000 feet, score 2122. Two. That gets us to a place where the aircraft is all prepped and we're about to start our briefing. APU master goes on, we start the APU three seconds after we press the button we're looking for, and you'll see the page comes up. So we can now brief, talk all about it, and uh, by the time we've finished the briefing, then they should have all the passengers on, everything's ready to go. This doesn't take half as long as it has done right now because I'm talking it through. So we'll just wait for the APU to come on, then we can turn off the external power, and that will get us to the point where we'll be ready for the engine start. So you just see the APU's coming up online now, it's going to say unveiled in a moment, there's a veil, and in fact you've got an veil light in the APU. So external power can go off, make sure before you tell the ground crew to get rid of external power that you want to push that because there is a danger they can actually be injured uh, if they're disconnected without being like the you know, uh, OK, so there's the GPU removed and on the overhead panel you'll see the lights no longer on. Briefings are complete. I'm not going to go through briefings with you today but you can assume your briefing is fully completed and as pilot flying with all the paperwork done we uh, check the load sheet and if there's any revisions to the zero fuel weight um, or the takeoff weight or anything like that then we need to go in and make sure the box is correct and depending on the company policy you may well need to recompute your takeoff data and ours is actually as advertised so there are no changes today so we'll call for the cockpit preparation checklist uh, that says gear pins and colours they are removed fuel quantity we have 9540 kilograms I'm just checking that it's equally balanced. Yeah, that's balanced across the aircraft. Seat belts on. 
modern aircraft you won't see the no smoking sign it's actually um, a no portable electronic devices okay. ADIRS nav and you can see I've probably got um, a horrendous shift on here uh, so it's clearly it's quite upset about where it is uh, that's definitely not cap is it that should be showing zero we certainly wouldn't go flying with the map shift like that for some uh, odd miles and Barrow Ref QNH 1021, both pilots confirmed QNH 1021. I bet the other side hasn't got it. It has actually, that's great. And the captain's checking that also 1021 is on the standby. That's cockpit preparation checklist complete. At this stage, pilot flying talks to ground. Pilot to ground, hello, can I take checks please? I'll give you the checks and you ask them to stand by. Pilot monitoring course of air traffic control. Gains take off, uh, sorry, start clearance. So pilot flying puts the beacon on, make sure we've got the APU bleed on if we didn't do before, and we can have a look at the status page down here. Meanwhile, Pilot Monitoring is going to put the transponder to auto. We're both going to check our windows are closed at them, looking at this little red indicator there. iPads can go into aero mode and also the company phone can go off and then call the four start checklist parking brake on and we're looking for parking brake on in two places here on the um, upper display unit and also we're looking on the pressure indicator we're not looking at the position of the handle particularly take off speed and thrust so we'll need our first page up we'll also need our ipads um, so we can check against it and we would read out exactly what it says there. The person reading it reads from the McD. The person checking checks the iPad and also the display on the PFD in front of them. So I'll just do one side and it's going to be V1134, VR135, V2136, Flex52. Windows closed and you're checking your own window and also the window of the other pilot. Beacon. Have to look up here at the switch. On. Four start check is complete. We call flight deck to ground and tell them about the appearance. They'll say please release the parking brake. We're not going to release the parking brake, we're not going to do a pushback today, but we are going to start the engine. And they'll say clear to start to embolic sequence or whatever they might like to say to you. So you turn the start step to, to ignition start and have a look down here. We should have the cross line indication on the valves here and also pressure. Starting engine 2. So, pop the steps on. That's it. We just watch the start. Don't do anything with it. And it's um, on the Airbus, it's quite interesting. It's a silent start. So, you, so in other aircraft, you find people are talking about N2, GT, N1, fuel flow, that kind of thing. We don't say anything here, and if it goes wrong, the FADEC will tend to look after the aircraft. So we're not going to even turn the switch off. Um, we'll let the FADEC deal with things. We probably just heard a little click there as the uh, electrical system starts transferring over. The reverse video is on the end too. The veil lights on. That's a good start on engine two. Starting engine one. Again, by this stage we're probably at the end of the pushback and the parking brake has been set again. So you can see that the frame is all coming up nicely. Good stage to start this one. There's that telltale clunk from the CBs and uh, brakes behind you. The reverse video goes on from the surveil light. That's two good starts. So what we're going to do at this stage is the pilot flying selects normal. It goes to the overhead pole, turns the APU bleed off. I'm still not happy with that engine two fault, but I don't think it's going to go away. If we're using engine anti-ice, we'll turn it on. We're not using that today. And the master switch goes off. 
So that's going to shut the APU down now for a period of uh, about a minute or so. Meanwhile, the PM, as soon as the AP, that switch was moved uh, to normal, can do that with the speed brakes. On them. Press and hold to neutralise that, the uh, red trim, and then we set the flaps to whatever it would be, in this case, flap one. Uh, let me just get into a good position here. Uh, what you want to do is have a look at the fuel prediction page, and you might see. Uh, does it give you anything? Useless, isn't it? So, on the modern ones, they actually tell you uh, what to set. Actually, there we go. Sorry, it does. I mean, so, it's 19.8 is CG. So, what we want to do is set our CG to 19.8, which is really massive. That trim on this one. It's about there. So, do you remember we put 1.9 up? And you can see it's about 1.9, 19.8. We actually set it using CG. Previously, they used to use up and down, but there have been instances where people put one up rather than one down. Whereas if you use a, a MAC percentage, you will always be in the right place. So that's where it's referenced from, is the fuel prediction page. Um, that fuel prediction page will only show you the CG after the engine starts uh, again. Once you've done all of that, you can then ask the ground crew to disconnect. Make sure they're clear of the aircraft, and when they're clear of the aircraft, we'll do a start checklist which says anti ice. Let's have a look upstairs. Off. It may be engine on or engine wing on. Ecom status. Checked. Pitch trim 19.8%. Rudder trim. So look. Neutral, our start checklist is complete. We then call the taxi. So of course as we're taxiing along, what we're going to do is pop the taxi light on. We go clear left, clear right, and toggle off on our taxi route again. We're just going to stay on stand for this and imagine we're taxiing. But at that point, um, the first thing we do is call brake check. We apply the brakes and the other pilot makes sure um, I just very briefly remove the part weight but there's no pressure showing on there. Let's put that back on before we go rearing into the terminal. So we're just looking at on the great pressure indicator. And then at a suitable point we'll call flight control check. That'll be pull up, pull down, neutral, pull left, all right, neutral. You can see this one's actually got the uh, ailerons and rudder coupled together because I'm using the mouse for the demonstration. But normally hold down the um, red disconnect button on the tiller, which we're steering with, and we can then, then go rudder. So it's not rudder check, it's just the word rudder. Full left, full right, neutral. I know I did that really quickly. Actually, with the rudder, it's a great big surface. So move it nice and smoothly left to right. You don't want to see anything banging that around at the back of the aircraft. The pilot monitoring then silently checks their controls just to make sure the side stick working correctly. And having done that, it goes round, presses the max auto brake button. Has a look down here, check the squat's correct, flap setting over to weather and predictive wind shear and we can now turn that system on we're going to press the takeoff config button and you can see that we're just waiting for the cabin so let's go and by the magic of a flight attendant panel that we haven't got on the real aircraft do that and it's all good call for the taxi checklist and it says flight control is checked both of us respond checked flap setting both of us respond to this config one plus f Radar and predicted wind shear. And we can actually see here on the screen that the radars are on. We're looking in the, on the screen rather than the selector on. If it's the older model, like that one, it may be on and auto. The PWS system gets switched to auto on those ones. Engine mode selector, just looking down, normal. Again, if you were heading off into the adverse weather, it could be an ignition start. Um, you'd all send it back to normal first because 
Um, you have to go back to normal and then back to the mission start to get the United going fully. And the last item is ECAM memo. Take off no blue is the response. There is no blue there. Taxi checklist is complete. So off we go. We're now over at the runway and we're given a line up. At that point, strobe lights go on, runway turn off, and this is going to be company specific. In my company, we put on the landing lights, we wouldn't touch the nose light just yet. So that's the pilot flying that does that. The pilot monitoring, meanwhile, is going to turn the TCAS to TARA and they're going to uh, just push the PA button and do a quick PA. I won't do that because that will run all kinds of silly announcements in this. Um, it just uh, alerts the camera people about an information takeoff and then we'll call for the lineup checklist. That checklist goes like this takeoff runway and then there's two six left, both of us identified, including if there's an intersection. T cast, the only way we can tell where the T cast is is by actually physically looking out that selection to make us in the TARA. And there's one item that I forgot to do. We'll do it now. Both packs go off. Packs one and two off. You may actually be running the APU and um, having the packs on, but normally for most of us it's going to be packs off. That's the lineup checklist to complete. From there, it's time to go flying. So we're now lined up on the runway. We get cleared for takeoff. We put the nose light on, but as you can see, if we try and take off here, we'll um, have an interesting day. So, hopefully next time I'll get uh, an opportunity to show you how to actually fly the thing a little bit. But for now, that's just a nice brief overview of uh, AV21 Starship Operator. Hope that's useful, hope you enjoy it, and, um, you know, see you again soon, hopefully.